Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode. Tonight's episode, as they say, has been a long time coming. The concept of tonight's talk uh, came to me a, a couple years ago. I believe it was 2015, 14, 15. And I've had various moments in this life where this concept that I'm explaining in this talk, I've seen it in so many unique ways that hopefully I can do it justice and share the most important uh, components. Ooh, it's like I gotta climb a lot of big mountain in this talk. I have this habit of playing with language. There's moments where I don't take myself uh, seriously and there's times where I don't take language seriously. That gives me an ability to kind of see the language in different contexts. Sometimes I find the intelligence of a person has to do with their level of concentration, which means the intensity of how much attention is being reality. The title is The Masterpiece, and it's a play on words on the concept, The Masterpiece. I can say that, um, at least in my personal experience, I have attempted uh, certain moments of my life uh, trying to see my ultimate effort. And something very interesting happens because in when you reach the edge of a certain external effort it becomes an internal effort as if like you can say hope is how your mind is still continuing but your body is not sure I've had moments where the known, my knowledge has moved, how the unknown appears to me, and there's been times where the unknown has moved, how knowledge appears to me. I find that the true masterpiece is not a purely conceptual action. It's an action that eventually, ideologically, you reach a point where you have to just trust the movement. That means th just like how human beings must trust their world, thoughts must trust the experiencer.
How do I approach this? Look at the concept pieces. Look at the concept piece. The concept piece suggests all of it working in harmony, all connected. The concept pieces suggests the separation of the intelligence. <clears throat> we have to acknowledge that a word part of a language is like a citizen of a community of similar phenomena. And I don't know how to say this, but I find that a masterpiece is kind of finding the pieces. I'm just contemplating it as if the greatest masterpiece, if whatever it is externalized, must also be simultaneously an inner state. And I'm trying to contemplate the state of mind and <clears throat> what comes to my attention is that eventually the conscious framework in order to evoke an expression greater than what it is, the, its most ultimate expression, it must let go. And sometimes the conscious, uh, the intelligence of the person has to let go as a new character. You can playfully say that people in life experience subjective births and deaths all the time. But the objectivity remains. Like, think of how many times in this world you've looked at things and you've been a type of person to yourself. How, the, how your mind interpreted the texture of itself. Rumi has this quote where he says, let the water settle and you shall see the moon and the stars uh, mirrored in your being. And what that means is sometimes when the inefficiency, if the inefficiency is from an action at that stops, uh, then what will remain will be automatically more efficient. It's like when you do, when you stop doing what's not working, there is more of a chance to things work for things to work, you know. <sighs> There's this very nice Sufi dervish story in other words this story comes to us from the eastern parts of the world and so in the Sufi dervish tradition the dervish you can uh, if that word is uncommon to you is a mystic you can say mystic of the east <clears throat> they were kind of like the Gnostics of Islam you know In the Sufi tradition, the concept of enlightenment was alive in their eyes and they acknowledge enlightenment as a pearl, like a pearl in a seashell. So in other words, just like how in some cultures you would look at somebody and they would call that person Mahatma in, for example, the Indian tradition, great soul, you know. Similarly, somebody who knew their true self, the true nature of reality, that person had the pearl. And so evidently this young kid hears there's this enlightened sage, uh, enlightened Sufi dervish in this uh, marketplace. <coughs> now, this kid goes, this kid goes to ask this kind of uh, enlightened guy what it's all about. 
and he goes in the market and the market's a busy place and the kid finds the guy and the guy's like in the middle of with his grocery bag well, uh, like you know filled with you know probably they had pieces of cloth they carried fruit in so whatever his basket or whatever <laughs> so he he he, he puts his grocery he, he's he's kind of you know walking and then this kid comes up to him and says sir you have to tell me the you have to give me the pearl and he says that you i want you have help me release uh help me get rid of all my attachments there we go help me get rid of all my attachments in this world all the chains all the things i'm connected to pretty much he's telling this guy with the pearl to release his karma <clears throat> And so the guy, <laughs> the enlightened Sufi dervish, kind of in that second puts his kind of like bag down, his basket down, uh, grocery basket. <laughs> he puts his shopping cart to the side. <laughs> and in that moment, he suddenly puts his bag to the side and he grabs, he hugs a column, like a stone column. And he starts shouting like a crazy person. He starts shouting, save me from this pillar. Save me from this stone column. Save me, save me. Like the guy's going crazy. The guy's going intense. Like in, with an in next level intensity. <clears throat> this kid gets embarrassed. <laughs> he gets embarrassed and the market people are like, oh my God, what's going on? Who's shouting? Everybody's looking and the kid quickly runs up to the guy, you know, and says, hey man, stop doing this. You know, he says, stop doing this. You know, if you want to free yourself from the, from the column, just let go of your hands, man. Just let go. Just let go. In that second, the dervish drops the act, looks at the kid, and he says, there you go. That's how you get rid of your karma. You let it go in an instant. <laughs> is there any way, is there any other way when you have something, it's either it go, leaves you instantly, or it leaves you slowly, or it doesn't leave you. You know, it's, it's a changeless component to the moment, you know. A great discovery I made was that I noticed that in the subjective room, you can say in the subjective realm, when we visualize something, it's as if the Im imagined idea, the thought, the design has freedom to move. That means I can see an object right now in front of me. I can also imagine this object hovering in the air. Now that imagination of the object hovering in the air, I noticed that that has a freedom. Literally the world of that space is free. So in some sense, we are uh, on one angle in a world and on another angle, the world is in us. We are exposed to a certain range of awareness kind of like how this <clears throat> um writer kind of said that it's like um zen and the art, art of motorcycle maintenance i think it was the author of that he, he had this very nice quote where he said something like you take a handful of sand and call this your awareness <laughs> so it, it i find that it's kind of like the humility of acknowledging your limits that then you the, you can even find the right questions of to ask about the limitless now what a masterpiece is is i have realized the masterpiece can only be seen by the past if you're looking at it from the future there's always another one you know <clears throat> but i find that ultimately it has to be a balance so you can say a person's masterpiece is a balance of the light uh, and dark aspects of their nature. It is literally their greatest efforts external externalization. And I've kind of noticed the most efficient way the great, this great effort can appear is through peace. You know, peace, a lot of us uh, are introduced to the idea through religion maybe, maybe through certain soft imagery. But peace is any time the pieces uh, all have the same. Uh, no, let me say it, say it differently. <clears throat> it's as if peace is when the same freedom of opportunity, it's like the potential is given. You know? Because on some level, if we wanted to create world peace, if it was something to build, we had to be responsible for the state of our civilization by being responsible for the state of our minds. 
To build peace means to create a space where disturbance, it's as if the creative energy is more than, you can say, the destructive energy. You know, an interesting idea came to me right now. That if we were to imagine in the future, everybody who wanted to do something violent, they just connected a virtual reality headset and it kind of um, alleviated their violence that way. What can be said about the unknown other than it's beyond knowledge? What can be said to be or said about the known that it's left to our exploration? You know, there was a time where I feared extinction. Extinction, not death. Death is not ex uh, death as long as the civilization remains. It's kind of strange. Anything the human being does will change him. Any action. So by, um, in some sense, anything we do, like every word I say, uh, repositions the attention to the whole thing. So we kind of like, I'm, the way I'm kind of getting the sense of it is that literally our subjective realm can be evoked anytime. That means the mind is not something where you per se, it's like a muscle of the brain. I mean, I'm not denying the brain. I'm just saying that the mind, the, how the intelligence appears, it is evocational. That means <clears throat> it's kind of like rather than uh, imagine evolution is happening on a very slow level. But there is also moments where the attention of the creature can shift itself. It can move itself. Just like how you can move to a different location, the attention can move towards a different inner space. I find the mind is multi-local, the body is just in a singular dimension. Kind of like you see a symbiosis of two different life forms, it becomes like a two a symbiosis of two different dimensions.
Da Vinci says to develop a complete mind, study the science of art, study the art of science. Learn to see, realize how everything connects to everything else. Michelangelo, this Italian sculptor, he says, I saw the angel in the stone and I set it free. There was, in, in both views, uh, it, it's as if the eyes of the person, it's like, it's kind of fascinating. Like, the more complex your world is seen by you, the more possibilities of change it has. That means on some level, the task is finding symbols to put on objects. But on another level, is the task is to kind of see the transition, the evolution of the symbology. Kind of so what that means is like you're not just communicating, you're also interpreting the communication. <clears throat> so on one level, you're an expressive entity. On another uh, level, you're a receptive entity. On one level, you're being defined by how you move energy. You know how energy is moved. And on another level, it's like how energy is maintained. So uh, I've kind of spoken about this in another way where I say it's like your mind is like a sword and shield. When you listen, you are, it's your mind is like a shield. Literally, it's as if the stance of the being is being considered. But when you, for example, speak, it's a, it's a totally different thing. It's, it's as if like um, the sword becomes the paintbrush of the artist drawing a new picture. So you cannot kind of like the same thing like Uncle Ben told Spider-Man, like, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. With great vision, eventually comes great action. So it's like you cannot see something uh, uh, every day and eventually not have that influence you. Now imagine if your philosophical positioning of the meaning of the world you were looking at every day and eventually you saw how it moves. So on some level we can say the point of life is not for us as, ev as changing evolutionary creatures to just take one snapshot of ideology and say this is it. So to be honest, the greatest masterpiece will be an endless update. <laughs> Do you see? It's going to be the, a state where there is nothing um, superior, you know? Like if I tell you, tell me a, a greater concept than expansion, what would you say? <clears throat> there is no con greater concept than that which uh, uh, takes space. So I'll give you an example. Some, con some words take space in the mind, some words don't. If I tell you the word chair, okay, the word chair, you're going to imagine a chair maybe. So that it, suddenly it takes an image space in the mind. That means the, just the sound entering your ear brings, that, brings an image. And that image, there's a sort of energetic... Uh, a projection of it so your body's literally you're using your the brain's using energy to move the neurons you can say or you can say the neurons movement is energy you know whichever <clears throat> way you choose to wield the world that day you know If you compartmentalize your intelligence, you have to go th go through it through, tr like if you associate, if you identify with an object, the moment that object changes, <coughs> your identity changes.
Excuse me, guys. You know, if we look at our objective biological existence, we are dependent on the world. That means you can't survive unless you take from the world and give also, but you have to like consume food. You have to drink water. These are actions of taking. You know, it's like, why doesn't somebody who like imagine... <clears throat> Uh, it's like, why isn't there guilt on simple actions, but on complex? Why is it that it's like when a human being um, um, is hurt, it's as if there's, um, how can I tell you? It's as if we, um, when we see, for example, violence in the street, people are taken, you know, uh, uh it's as if there's a sort of consequence to human behavior that it's all about value, guys. This is the unique thing. We don't value ants like a human. That means if a child kills, kills an ant, the parent is not going to cry, you know, oh my God, we're going to get sued by the ant kingdom, you know? Like it's not, the, the parent get, doesn't get worried. <laughs> You know, so it's as if we are seeing animate life, but we're not caring for its complexity. Therefore, it's becoming dismissed. We look at an animal like a buffalo. We see a lion eat a gazelle and we're like, okay, if the lion eats a gazelle, I mean, definitely an evolved monkey can eat a gazelle, you know. <laughs> so I'm saying that we first divided the world into pieces. Then we gave each piece a different value. And love is when the illusion of all these pieces is shattered. And here's the unique thing. I, I kind of feel that... The experiences a person goes through... Suggests the meaning they will see. Therefore... Any sort of love the person seeks seeks in this world? It's kind of like realizing you are not it's it's like you're building yourself with your own building blocks of value and meaning. And these building blocks, some of them are in your conscious mind, some of them you can say, you know, um, you know, in a Jungian way are in your unconscious and you have to make the unconscious conscious. You know, for example, any explorer that just explored, it's the same thing with the mind. But the mind, it's not a visit, it's not a tangible thing. It's not like a phys physical arena. So we can't explore the mind like we explore land in new, new parts of the world. So we study, I, I personally, of course, right now as I'm speaking, I'm going more towards a more my personal, very, very personal views on this matter, but it's, um, it's like, could you consider it as a rebirth if somebody in one side of a portal went into the portal passed the portal and went to the other side and the other side of the portal was another world when you try to wonder about the psychology and the identity of the person you're like it's as if the person's consciousness was defined by the environment of their world but once they figure out there's another world it's as if like they begin defi getting defined by that environment so you can say the astronaut that goes in space it, it's psychology is getting influenced by an absence of an environment that has sculpted its thinking for so long. <clears throat> of course, there, in, in life, it's like uh, there's a lot of pressures. You know, it's like it, it's kind of like a vehicle. Life is like a vehicle. 
What that means is some moments you run out of gas. <laughs> some moments, you know, you, you have a lot of gas. You, you know, you, the effort goes longer. When you treat yourself as an energetic being, it's very different than treating yourself as a creature of thought, with a, as a character in a story with a certain kind of memory outline and a sort of road of experiences. It, it becomes like um, you use what is needed <clears throat> uh, for as long as it is needed. That means right now, the reason, uh, uh, you know, uh, at least Mr. Within here is talking about like, <laughs> like the reason I'm talking about um, uh, enlightenment and, and these sorts of concepts is because this is what is needed now. It's like this is the medicine civilization needs because true, uh, true wisdom is, I believe, is, is, is the witness's core. So what it, what it means, it's, it's kind of like right now you're taking maybe 50% responsibility for your world. <clears throat> Therefore, you feel some things aren't in your control. You know, uh, let's say responsibility for your mind. But if you were to take 100% responsibility for your mind, that would be terrifying. I don't want to say it would be terrifying, but it, 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 it's going to be terrifying for the ego because it, it would mean you, the unconscious and the conscious divide, what divides the known and the unknown suddenly fading and then becoming one moment. Now, <clears throat> to be honest, this is instantly being done by every being in the present moment. I don't believe people are good and bad. I believe people are aware of what is good and bad and in accordance to what they're aware of, they just make decisions. Because you can't say like like imagine a de on on like let's let's say right now you're a person who's like you feel you're a good person, so imagine one day that you felt you were bad. Now, do you think it would be fair if someone saw you on the one day you were you felt bad and thought you were you were a bad person? Like you'd see it's as if no, who you who you are changes. Literally, it's like, you, this is why it doesn't at some point make sense to think about stress. And sometimes uh, it, it, it's, it also goes with certain deep questions, you know, <clears throat> it's as if somebody wants the answer, but then the enlightened sage comes and says the question is wrong. <laughs> it's like, what do you do then? You know, that's an answer on its own. <clears throat> And uh, the reason I'm explaining this is because the more we become aware of our minds, uh, the more there is freedom of expression. And it's trust and expression that leads to the, uh, to the masterpiece. That means you master order by confronting chaos and you master order uh, chaos by confronting order. So your mind has to learn to be everything and nothing and nothing in everything. <laughs> we have to start treating ourselves as multidimensional creatures. We're, the reason we suffer is because we treat it in accordance to just a certain dimension of meaning. So, of course, we suffer. Of course, when death comes, it's just going to be super unknown. You know? <laughs> it's the attention that we have to study. So, it's kind of like how your attention moves. And at first, you require a certain amount of conceptual knowledge. But eventually it gets to a point where it becomes rhythmic. So you don't think about life anymore. It's more like life is already happening. You, you've just opened your eyes in it. You see, it's like you would trust life more in that context than in, in a context where you're just the hallucination of electrons freaking out over the meaning of life. Kind of like trying, we're trying to think why Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway made Wilson, made that volleyball into uh, <clears throat> a companion. So the same effort that makes the animate, that makes the inanimate animate to the person 
it's also the same effort of what's making the world alive or the world being lifeless. I've had days where I've kind of woken up and I've been shocked. I've been shocked um, to my own um, sensitivity to the passage of time. It's kind of like, of course, there's time moving in a linear way. Let's entertain it like that. But you'll notice every space has a different experience of time. You know, some days you wake up and you feel life is short. Some days you wake up, you feel life is long. You know, so what does that mean? That means time is being uh, extracted. It's as if the environment's voice and the voice of your memory are coagulating to be a sort of personification of the moment. It's kind of cool because on some level we, we're trying to explain the mind as if it's an engine we're trying to take apart. Uh, not the mind, the psych, like let me say it, the psychological notion of, uh, of pretty much the brain's soul is the idea of the mind. I find it kind of like a mystical clue that we see in, in pretty much in history and a lot of uh, people, their philosophies. I mean, let's, let's take the, push the philosopher aside for a second, the concept of a philosopher, and let's say everybody has philosophies. Now, we'd see the philosophy of the person was more was defined or colored in by their most immediate experience and for example when the guy was a blacksmith it was easy for him to believe in the nordic mythology you know it's like for example the guy was <clears throat> you know a horseman and for example you know that archetype played in the mind of that being. You know, I, I think kind of what I'm <clears throat> catching on to with these talks into the online stage it's like when I was in in Iran, when I kind of visited in Iran in one summer. This is a long time ago, years ago, I think more than 10 years ago. Um, when I visited Iran, um, the country I was born in. But at the same time, I don't, I believe nations to be kind of like... Uh, the ego of, of chunks of land, like it's... <laughs> But anyways, <clears throat> uh, I had an experience where I went snowboarding. Iran had this mountain called Tocha, and I, it had the second sound, the second kind of station of this mountain, where, it, anyways, it was this river that had kind of like a lot of snow had come on top of it. And I, I remember I snowboard down, and I was like one of the maybe like it was my tenth time snowboarding in my life, like. And, and so in that moment, I was snowboarding, and then I kind of fall down, and suddenly I hear the sound of water, as if water is running and moving. Suddenly, some guy comes, 
and he pulls me up and I see where I fell was a giant hole. And from that hole, I could see the river underneath the thing moving, right? And it was a very intense moment. For, like it, but it was as if I felt I had noticed something earlier. <clears throat> and pretty much what I had noticed was the mountain was totally unsafe to snowboard. I don't know what how people were snowboarding. Like now, now thinking about it, it's like crazy. <laughs> We're all snowboarding on like this river, you know. <laughs> find the masterpiece and you will find your masterpiece. Attain a sort of contentment with how your mind is and how your mind moves. And then you'll realize all your problems with, uh, uh, no, I say problems, but all uh, disharmonies with physical structure move away. The mind is so advanced, it doesn't matter. It's like, I'm, I'm telling you, you're, 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 you're fit the, as physical entities, it's like, who can judge atoms? You know, can we say atoms composed in one way is more beautiful than atoms composed in another? <laughs> <clears throat> as far as we're concerned, we're all made of stardust, you know. So, you know, I don't know what people are doing in these, you know, beauty contests. It's like they're just judging stardust, you know. <laughs> I find there's two ways of learning in this life you you're either learning from others or you're learning from yourself and when you wisen up you'll realize learning from others is actually learning from uh, your new self what that what that means is you're you're never hearing these words that i'm saying the way i'm saying it based on the experiences i've had your, your dna is like your universe so I'm speaking from my own universe and through language is kind of being this bridge of image communication from my universe to yours, you know? And so as human beings kind of really master reception and expression, literally we can, um, <clears throat> we, we, we are comfortable processing data and we're con comfortable receiving data. When we're comfortable with the data of our dimension, then, then, you can say the mystics can speak comfortably again in, in, in society. Because right now it's kind of like we don't realize it. The subconscious of our civilization is, is like an inquisition. It's like, how can you enlighten a robot when the robot writes its program itself? It eventually comes into a domain where there is no control. Kind of like I think what the concept of angels, how angels would feel looking at human beings. We, you see, I remember, I don't know who it was, but it was this kind of Western philosopher or European philosopher who said something like that angels, what separates angels and man is that angels cannot resist or move against the divine will. That means the angel has to listen to God. But man is in a dimension where his free will, it's like man's, the, the game of human beings is kind of like just the discovery of, that we're just trying to localize free will. <clears throat> we're just trying to figure where it all starts from and realize it's the moment. So what I'm saying is all knowledge began from an instant a spontaneity. Literally, there was nothing else to have a reference to. So the origin of existence is by de but just by the nature of our conceptual grasp, subjective grasp, inconceivable. Because it's instantaneous. Every word we have, we are referring to different points. So I'm saying it's like the source of existence was just a single dot. 
but everything else that me and you are kind of in our in this universe is like a line it's like two dots you know every word i'm i'm using i'm referring it's as if it's kind of like that you could even draw it on paper geometrically how it would look <clears throat> so i'm saying language is a dualistic technology this is of course known so i'm saying the origin of reality is like we're wondering what gave birth to light and, uh you know dark like chaos and order <laughs> And we are realizing it's an instant, it's an instant of, of like, this is the unique thing. Like, forget all the spiritual, like, kind of esoteric ghost theosophy, like that, that stuff is like child's play, you know? Esoteric societies, I find that it's, um, it's there's nothing spiritual about it. There's everything mental about it, but there's nothing, when I say mental, I mean, it's mind oriented. Because it's still a character trying to get to heaven. Anytime life looks like a video game, know that you are in you you are in literally a simulation of language. When you feel life is feels like a video game, that means your your intelligence is choosing to see character world, you know. But the mystical uh, uh, um, vision I find is doesn't see character world. It doesn't. It, at some point, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what atoms your attention is in. The mind knows itself. The presence is being itself. The instantaneity of being surpasses whatever you do because it's like the uh, foundation of action. <clears throat> kind of like a, how they say if a tree falls in a forest, would any, if there's nobody there to kind of hear it, it's like, did it ever make a noise? And so some philosophers in history are like, yes, it made a noise. It doesn't matter if we heard it or not, you know. And some people are like, nah, man, it didn't make a noise. How do you know the tree even fell if you went there? You know, and so eventually it gets to a point where uh, the linguistic simulation begins to shake as we reach the edge of the language threshold. And civilization, it's going to take a while. It, now, I, like, it's not going to take a while. It's just that literally the reason... Like it's like there's more destructive activity than creative and constructive activity because the 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 cost of survival is just too energy consuming and too attention consuming. That means I thought, let's imagine fifty years from now, you know, automation has has taken over every labor job. What would human beings do? It's as if by by the by the miracles of technology, we don't need to do any physical labor anymore. So literally, every person who had a job at a factory no longer that job is required to be done by the person. So what it means is we're eventually transitioning from um, using uh, nature as a vehicle of expression into becoming minds uh, that are being world. So it's like we are, fir we are first um, kind of like um, a mind in a world, then, we're, it's, it's, um, then it's like uh, uh, <laughs> we're mind in a world and then the, uh, kind of like the self and the other dualism fades as its witness instantaneously and then it becomes world and mind. It's like literally they're not separated to even be conceptualized that way. Because some things you experience, it totally changes your viewpoint of how it was before. It's like we go back in history, we see language was 
created and then maintained. I say created because we were created at some point. And when I say created, I'm just saying like we were born at some point. So language was born. You can say inventions are born too. So, so what I'm saying is like literally we found use for something that we could have always done. We just, the pattern became conscious. So, so the unconscious is, is this vast landscape of uh, unknown patterns. And as the knowledge is expanding, it's seeing more of the forest, therefore getting more of a sense of how the intelligence is meaningful to itself. Um, on some level, I totally understand that we shouldn't look too deeply into the machinery. That means it's like if you have to break up the pieces of the car um, uh, to kind of be certain that the car is there, it might, once you've broken the pieces, it might be kind of very hard to put them back together. It's kind of like the cost of experimentation is the influence of the experimenter on the experiment. And sometimes it's irreversible. So what it means is like, For me, um, mastery was always the glimpse of a of world where the mistakes never existed. 
And so it's kind of like only the imperfect can see the pure perfection. And those who try to be internally perfect, they will externally see imperfection. It's kind of like you got to give your mind a chance to be a new view. If we look at it from imagination's point of view, <clears throat> reality is kind of like given imagination. If we look at it from reality's point of view, we can say it's kind of like imagination is deviated reality. It's honestly where you place your first reference point. That means literally when you wake up, where your attention goes as, as your intelligence is considered value, where the value is in your moment. And we're not like analytical creatures. I mean, just because I'm giving this talk doesn't mean every, pers every person in every moment has to be articulating everything all the time. Like, like we're not machines, it, it, but it's, um, we have to be aware of our environment because our environment is automatically becoming a part of our thinking. And the more unnatural the environment becomes, the more the person's going to feel unnatural. So that's the issue of kind of like technology is weird. It's kind of like <clears throat> a part of the mind is going against nature. And a part of the mind, if it goes against nature, has gone against its, its ultimate purpose. Do you know? So what I mean by that is even if uh, humanity messes up, and there's been even certain scholars who've said that, uh, human beings are the intermediaries to the machines. That means it's like the point of life is not that human beings continue on, but that the creation of humanity becomes some sort of unique technological AI mind that it's just it goes on conquering, not conquering, but exploring reality endlessly. It's as if all we, we would as human beings be at that point would just be a little uh, influence on the pattern of that movement. I find that uh, the DNA is a gift. That means imagine every person is this attributeless attention and their DNA provides certain ways that the world becomes like filled with attributes. So if you don't honor your intelligence, you can't even acknowledge it there to even see it. You know, Not to see it, but to... So what I'm saying is like the evolution of thought is like there's one way of being able to look at one thing and of course seeing a complexity and a multidimensionality to it. But there's also another way where I'm saying it's, 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 it's a rhythmic relationship and it has to do with giving freedom to the known aspects of your intelligence and also the unknown. That's, all, that's when the transition, the subconscious doesn't become like a veil of thought or the gate of paradise. Like it, it's like there's no gate anymore. pretty much you're getting rid of the ego of the world so there is there's is literally no um the present moment is enough you how you're alive and breathing is um is why nature designed you why nature's designs have led here, why we're on a rock that somehow is orbiting around this star and it's spinning in a way where the whole surface is getting hit by light. As if the planet, it's as if the planet was an accessory for the sun. That means the planet adjusted to the sun. So what I'm saying is we are literally in the presence of fields of intelligence that move in patterns that we literally are so, it's like we are, um,
Like literally, if the cells and in, in like the body were beings, similarly, the we as human beings are also being the cells for an unknown. You can say, um, or you can say, an attempt of the cosmos to be aware of itself. So it has to do with your mind. And if you don't trust it, it's literally some person who has a shield, but they don't trust like they can hold it. It's like, what's the point of having it then? You know? <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope this was helpful, but I feel this is as far as this talk can go. I find that when the person finds something truly new, you the being will automatically know what to do with it. That means it's kind of like how when someone truly loves someone, they're drawn to that person. So similarly, it, it, it's like it doesn't matter whatever sort of processing mechanism. It's as if the, the, ener the energy is being pulled that way. You would like, you know, it's... it's, it's um, Nature moves us before we define it. All right, guys. Good night. <laughs>